Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Tuesday live stream for Educator in the Learning Community. Say hello, hello. everyone. Hey. Hello, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Uh, for those of you who are used to joining us on Fridays, uh, you will notice that we've moved to Tuesdays, and this is our delightful Tuesday Educator live stream. As usual, we have Tom Shannon in the lower square. Say hello, hello. Tom Shannon. With this cool epic shirt. Check nope. out that epic shirt. Wow, that is some cool stuff. And then we've got Mark Flanagan in the top there, who's joining us from the United Kingdom. He's got his cool shirt. Mark recently had his heat fixed, so he's no longer wearing bundles of clothing. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I, I actually had blankets around my knees for most of my, my last um, month. And we also have Seven, who's joining us. Uh, and those of you who um, have joined us in previous streams, uh, you've seen Seven join us uh, on a couple of recent streams. Uh, Seven joined us on a stream we did on the Hour of Code maybe two weeks ago, which was a, a great stream. And uh, Seven's joined us on uh, previous streams focused on portfolio reviews. Uh, and you also joined us on a stream, gosh, maybe about seven or eight months ago when we yeah, talked about this, something this is else. Either, well, we talked about the fast track as well. So this is either, uh, I think this is time four for me on the stream, which is, is great. I know. Uh, I hope to get to the, the five times. I know. Uh, you, you'll get your red jacket like on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Sam is joining us on this stream uh, because today's stream is focused on the Global Game Jam, which is right around the corner. I think the date of the Global Game Jam to begin, which this year is going to be unique uh, because the Global Game Jam is all virtual around the world uh, and remote, I should say, um, kind of the same thing. And that's the focus of today's stream. We are going to focus today's stream on tips and tricks on helping teams uh, helping educators, helping everyone in the learning community uh, and enable and empower uh, anyone working remotely on virtual game jam games, uh, utilize tools from Unreal Engine and basically all the things that Epic does, but also, you know, looking at a variety of other tools to help enable folks working uh, in virtual teams to be successful uh, in global game jam games. So we'll be talking about a lot of things. Uh, at the beginning, I'll jump in and uh, jump into some of the Quixel, eco, uh, the Quixel ecosystem tools and talking about bringing in marketplace content, some of the free stuff that we provide through Epic Games, jumping in and showing you how you can not only use the Quixel tools to make photorealistic content, but very stylized content, which you can do very quickly and easily and modify a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, bring it into your game jam games and um, and really bring some you know diversity and and uh, really interesting looks to the stuff that you can work with, uh, bringing yeah. it out of Unreal, bringing it into Quixel, and bringing it back into Unreal. Mark will jump in and talk about some of the amazing free marketplace content uh, that really adds a lot of uh, variety to your games uh, for game jam. Then Tom will jump in and he will share uh, some amazing tips about how to set up Perfor servers uh, on AWS completely for free, uh, all open source. Well, not open source, but uh, these are companies that have made their tools available for teams. Uh, and, you know, Tom, you can give us a little preview about what you're going to share, maybe. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, since we're all virtual this year, um, trying to all work on the same project is going to be exceptionally challenging. You know, uh, I think a lot of game jams have relied on sneaker nets and past USB drives in the past. Um, but that's going to be really tricky now. Um, and so I think a lot of, uh, you know, beginners and even people who have been developing for a while and uh, haven't tackled using source control, um, They'll uh, hopefully, you know, I'm going to show how to set it up really easily. Things have improved in Perforce land, and there's an easy pass to getting it set up totally free uh, and getting hooked up. Like you can, you can get set up in like. Hopefully, I'll get it all set up in 20 minutes on the stream. Knock on Berkeley board. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, because it, it, otherwise, it's going to be really tricky to figure out how to work on a, a cool project. Uh, remotely without 
source control of some sort. So I'm going to look at Perforce, but it applies to anything. So hopefully that'll help you help some folks out. Perfect. I hope that everyone on this stream, the days of them sending a zip file back and forth or a Google Drive link, I hope those days are over. Please <laughs> use source control. <laughs> And then Seven's uh, going to jump on because Seven, prior to joining Epic, um, ran Global Game Jam for, I don't know, how long did you run Global Game Jam? Uh, for, for a couple of years. Uh, yeah, before, before coming to Epic, I was the executive director of Global Game Jam Incorporated. And so I am very, very uh, acquainted with Global Game Jam and, and Game Jams in general. And uh, really happy to, at this time of year, it's usually just... So much work. And it's really nice to see all this like stuff about Global Game Jam coming out and being like, oh, I just get to participate as a person. Just <laughs> that had to be an enormous amount of work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, for those of you that don't know, there are just two people. There are two people that put on uh, with a, a ton of volunteers. There are only two people that work on it year round. And through the help of lots and lots of volunteers and lots of dedicated people, they put it together. That's um, incredible. Yeah, that's yeah. absolutely awesome. Uh, so that'll be fantastic to um, really hear about your experience working with you know teams kind of all over the world, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and you'll share lots of tips and tricks, um, not only for those people participating, but for administrators and and uh, educators and um, anyone who's setting up game jams and game jam sites, maybe and and uh, all kinds of stuff there, you know, but also for anyone who's thinking about participating uh, and is thinking about making a, a, a game in a very short period of time, you know, some do's and don'ts, right? Because there's lots of people that jump in and they're like, well, you know, this is how I have got my head set about, you know, building a project. And I think that there are some things that can make them more successful and less successful. And so, Part of our goal with today's stream is to help uh, everyone maybe take advantage of some advice. You know, most of us part have participated now for years in one way or another, whether it's giving workshops at game jam sites or administering or, you know, running or um, helping facilitate participants. So, yeah, shall we? get into first a little bit of uh, initial discussion, which I think we want to have really surrounding what it means to, to do global game gems in general. I think some of the stuff that we want to kick off is uh, relevant to global game jam, but I think it's relevant to game jams as a whole. There's, you know, mm -hmm. game jams, if any of you have not participated in game jams as a whole, they're really a great way to exercise and flex your artistic, technical design muscles, right? And uh, in this day and age when there's great open source tools and there's engines like, you know, of course, like Unreal Engine and tools like uh, the Quixel tools, Twinmotion, uh, and all the, the services that Epic provides, um, you know, and of course, Epic Meg Mega Jam and, and all the things that are released through inside Unreal, there's just amazing opportunities to practice. There's amazing opportunities to try your hand at designing, try your hand at having a limited amount of time, but also focus. I think one of the greatest things about game jams as a whole is that you are given direction, you know, and maybe you can speak a little bit to this on the high level, uh, Seven, you know, from your experience about what it means to be given a mission and a purpose and, 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 have people actually uh, have that direction to work from? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, seeing like seeing it at thirty thousand feet, you know, seeing every single uh, every like all the games that are being made and looking at it at the end, um, it's it, it's incredible seeing individual cultures. I don't think we often think about this uh, when it comes to, you know, the internet has kind of made um, game development global, but we don't really think about the way that um, certain cultures use different game mechanics differently. Uh, and, and, you know, a, a lot of people will say they'll talk about JRPGs and Western RPGs, but not really think about how that impacts 
the mechanics of the game. Um, and it's, you know, when you, when you have this theme that is, is made to really be broad and interpreted in so many different ways, um, mm. you can see like just, just all the ways that we can be similar as, as human beings and all the ways that just we can be uh, very different. One of the things I thought was, was very amusing uh, a couple of years ago when the theme was transmission. Um, to us, when I say transmission, right, radio transmission, car transmission, um, all of that. And then when you look at um, uh, languages like Japanese, they have different words for all of those. <laughs> And so they know which one they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And and so even just thinking about the way in which we, we engage with language um, and engage with the theme uh, really just changes. The way in which we read makes a difference as well. Um, you know, whether we read right to left, left to right, up and down, um, that, that changes the way in which people perceive an awful lot of things which they see in screens. Oh, yeah. I mean, even platformers, right? Thinking all the way back, like, you, you know... Uh, you're reading from left to right platform levels, you intuitively know, okay, I'm going to go from left to right. And just small things like that, the mechanics that we don't often, often think about. Um, really cool to interact with and see at a high level. In, it's... in conclusion, Lewis, I don't know if I answered your question at all, but that was an important thing for me to say. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, thanks. Now, can you get back to the, <laughs> no. uh, I think that, you know, I think that's a very good point. You know, global game jam, I think is really important because it is a global event where you get to see a lot of variety of people uh, showing how they play or how they approach play, how they approach gaming. Uh, but there's a lot of things about it. And there's a lot of things about game jams as a whole. Uh, one, it creates this opportunity for people to get together and collaborate on stuff. And, uh, you know, of course, People go to school and they are forced to collaborate, but this is an opportunity to choose to collaborate, right? And uh, and it, it makes a big difference. And and then also you're not told how to collaborate. And so in an educational setting, there are many situations where you're set up and you're you're told how to collaborate. And then you know maybe when you get into later undergraduate years or even in graduate school, you're kind of told how to collaborate. But a game jam situation situation where you you know hundreds of people or dozens of people or you know small groups of people of any number are basically brought into a room and it kind of separates us because you know we see pens of mammals of all different kinds all the time and you don't see farm animals collaborating quite frequently but humans have the opportunity well you know you see packs of wolves and stuff like that but uh, uh and that's very interesting uh you know it's a different discussion um well, that spawns a game in my head right now, but um, <laughs> <laughs> game design what just happened. <laughs> um, uh, but you know that the the, the uh, opportunity to collaborate in this way is is really interesting, you know. And, and then it creates these roles, you know, the idea of an artist, a designer, and a programmer, uh, and and what it means to you know divide and conquer and assemble, but then finish, right? You know. Mm -hmm. uh, especially when you're talking about um, many game jams happen over a course of a weekend and you, you get a theme maybe on a Friday uh, and then everyone just grinds and grinds and grinds and maybe some people stay up the whole time, maybe some people don't. And uh, what the challenges become, and quite often it isn't so much whether it's the art design or whatever, it's the scope. Uh, there's so many things that, that become really interesting uh, factors in whether something can actually be finished and what the idea was at the beginning and then what actually comes out at the end. And uh, to me, um, and, you know, Tom and I have traveled quite a bit together and participated and supported lots and lots of jams uh, together. And <laughs> we kind of just have a blast going and supporting and seeing what happens day one and then what actually happened, <laughs> you know, the last day and, and, uh, and how ideas have evolved and, and what the final outcomes are. And some of them are amazing, right? So, uh, because there are some people that are on point that they came in like a, a, a small, well-trained, you know, tactical unit that was like, well, this is what we're going to make and this is how we're going to make it. <laughs> and they executed, you know, literally like a, a, a SWAT team, right? And uh, 
And they were able to pull it off with amazing execution. The, the artists did what they were supposed to do, and the designers did what they were supposed to do, and the program was like ding, ding, ding. And and it came out the way it's supposed to, whereas other teams find that uh, little moment of magic uh, that they didn't expect maybe at the beginning. And other teams fail frequently, fail often, and fail period, uh, where other teams fail frequently, fail often, and find the magic. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's, I think, the whole thing. I, I think one of the things with Jams, which is really, really valuable, is because it is that compressed... Um, you know, you're compressed in terms of time. Um, you have small teams. Um, you have to produce something. I, in its own right, that is a really valuable exercise to do something like that. I was actually inspired by Game Jams and set up something myself um, called VFX Jam, which I, I ran a couple of times in Melbourne, which was for visual effects. And it's remarkable how quickly people can come up with ideas and generate storyboards and realize a finished thing and get something done. Taking away all the second guessing, which people often have, is really great for creativity. And I think when people try it, quite a lot of companies actually run the equivalent of jams internally to actually to keep this flow of um, creativity going. Because sometimes having a very long period of time to develop something can actually tend to make things stale. You can't be stale with a game jam. It has to be, you know, just this idea, that idea. Collaboration is bouncing ideas off each other and then making a decision and going for it. I mean, in a game jam, production hell can only last a day or two. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, so does crunch, right? For yeah, today. Right. I mean, it's, and it is, it's, it's, it's pure crunch, but I think scope is a really key, key thing with game jam. And it's, I think it's one of the things that helps game jams really help teach you how to scope uh and how to fail and how to de-scope on the fly <laughs> because it's an essential skill i think naturally we all over scope we no all feature have creep game ideas in the middle of a stream um and feature creeps a real thing and and then trying to actually figure out why we're coming up with all these ideas and, and focusing it down and the teams that can do that and manage to focus on these you know few things and produce something in the end tend to really, really shine. Um, so, you know, I think, I think you said it, Mark, too. Also, there's a lot of failure, mm-hmm. I think. I don't know, Seven, you probably know the statistics better than me, but I'd say that, you know, usually there's probably a good 25, 30% of teams that sign up and work and they just can't submit. Their thing doesn't work, their idea, their team didn't gel. It's and this is you know it's and it's that's a, a, right. you know, yeah. a reality of development is yep. you will go down a road and spend a week trying to make something happen and in the end it either just doesn't work you got the wrong team <laughs> assembled to make it whatever um, and so there's so many it's it really is it's like taking all the lessons of game development and reducing them to a weekend. Um, and so it's it's hard, you know. That's the thing too is like game jams are they're pretty brutal. Uh, you're trying to make something in 24, 48, whatever hours, whatever your limit is, and it's it's a crucible. Um, and it really it takes all that like extra chaff and, bleh, and let's add sparkly. thing ruthless <laughs> at, at cutting scope and cutting features and and often it's usually like or often it's can we just get one thing working and we so we can get that one thing and submit that we, we won't win but we'd rather have a success and submit than not get there and have you know 22 broken ideas and we'll have two good ones and that's it's really hard to do and to do as a team um, it's it's really interesting as well to see the way different people work together. Mm. I mean, some people, you know, sitting down collaboratively, some people leading, some people that um, a flip chart that they'll actually start drawing on. Um, some people prototyping pen and paper, you know, with dice and all these other kind of ways. It it can be fascinating to see 
in a real life game jam how people actually work because that's something you don't often see that much of but when you've got you know several hundred people in whatever kind of facility you're in and you can actually see the way that they're working that's that's again um, really educational yeah absolutely it's um you know we're talking a little bit about the the team formation stages where mm -hmm. You know, the, there are stages of a team of uh, forming, storming, norming, and performing. And you have to do that all within, you know, two days. And so many people get stuck on the storming phase, which is where the project falls apart. Um, but I also found that I've heard a lot of anecdotes from Global Game Jam. And there's one that stuck out, which is um, this guy came up to me and he said, you know, oh, man, I participated in Global Game Jam last year. I had the most amount of fun. It was, it was a ridiculous experience. The game was awful, completely fell apart, didn't work, but it was such a great experience and I learned so much. And, and so I, I encourage you all to um, remember that making a game is definitely a part of it, but the journey uh, is a lot compared to the destination. Um, and so you can still have a great experience and learn a ton, but uh, not a lot really. of a lot of it is about forming those new teams as well. I mean, you can go in there and you can stick with your same old crew, but the, the best thing to my mind is to go in there and um, form teams. You know, find the, the people that you haven't worked with before and find people that you wouldn't necessarily see yourself uh, working in a team with before and work with them because, again, you, know, you learn stuff and you have fun. And that's it's great. You spend 48 hours working with somebody, you'll know an awful lot about them. <laughs> They well, could be your friend. I see when I've worked at game jams, there's there really is. There's like Lewis said, there there tends to be these teams that come in, they're preformed strike teams, or they're from a game studio or from a school or whatever, and, and they know each other. Um, and then there are people who just show up and you know hold up a sign, like I'm an audio designer who needs an yeah. audio designer. <laughs> yep. Um I love yeah. those guys. Right. It's, it's such an interest. And sometimes the team that comes fully formed is like, we don't have audio. Yeah. <laughs> Where's that yeah. guy with the sign and yeah. the MacBook? Get that, get him over here. Um, and it, it's really, it'll be interesting this year to see how that works because, you know, this year we're lacking in person. Yeah. I'm sure there's, there's a, there's, <laughs> and so it's going to be a little harder to hold up signs. Um, and I, I see this in the in the chat here uh, coming up of like, how am I going to find my team? Well, I imagine there's there's people posting online. I would hope there's there's folks posting on forums now. Uh, have you heard anything, Seven, about uh, well, if there, there are resource uh, forums? Yeah, I mean, if you if you go to the Global Game Jam site, you can still find your your local site, um, which will have your information. You know, for people in your area, um, they're using. I believe they're using Discord too handle the communication um, but you can also like um go on unreal slackers yeah. and and yep. just post in the game jam chat hey is anyone doing global game jam i assure you someone is um we saw i know we've seen hundreds of games made uh it, you know i'm just pulling off the numbers from a couple of years ago there were hundreds of games made in unreal at global game jam and they're probably probably thousands now made a global game jam uh, each weekend um, and so even though we're like totally virtual this year global game jam still has geographic sites so there's still you know a new york a, you know la raleigh um so they're still broken up geographically and you still join a site that is tied to a location <laughs> that you don't go to um but you know, back to the beginning of the conversation, this is important too because, uh, you know, it's it's a global game jam, but it's important to join a group that's close to you. Um, you know, culturally, it's important because you'll speak the same language. If you join a team in Japan, you might have some language barriers and time barrier, fluent <laughs> time barriers, cultural barriers. Um, so. It's really, you know, the, the idea of these events happening locally, but still virtually is still really important. The other thing is, um, 
you know, it, it helps limit because there's so many people that participate that we can't just have one wholly open global game jam. It would be, it would be bedlam. And then also, you know, each, each area, each site, has its own kind of set of rules and norms and prizes and you know so there's there's a local flavor to it as well that um, that's that's really important because a big part of this is community still and building that that game community in in these areas so even though we're all like totally virtual I still encourage everyone to try and find a, a local group but you know this year. If you can't and you live out in the middle of nowhere, um, you have the opportunity to, you know, go and do something that's nearby, but, you know, you don't have to travel this year and lock yourself in a, in a gym for three days. <laughs> Another thing I've seen certainly is um, areas, you know, around the US, around um, Europe, where there's lots of game development actually going on. The game jams there are obviously really important, but there's other areas where there's less game development actually happening, where there's communities still get together and have game jams. I'm thinking about areas, for instance, um, North Africa, they've had some really good ones. And, you know, there, there's places where the game jam is one of the high points of all the development. And teams actually grow out of this because they've met there. They've actually, they found other people who share their interests. They don't necessarily have as many companies they can go to or as many educational opportunities and game jams fill a really valuable role in the entire ecosystem of learning and of game development. Yeah. Uh, we've seen, yeah, we've seen companies form. I have been on a team where a guy got a job because there was a person, one of the people on our team was leaving a position and turns out he spent a weekend working with the other artist and said, you know what, I'm leaving this job, you should apply. Uh, he got hired there and that's where he met his wife. So- uh, <laughs> Wow, he won. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, also, we also had marriages game and the source. Global, game, global Game Jam babies as well, like people who met at Global Game How'd Jam. How'd you find the time? Married. You're making a game. I mean, Th that's- no, 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 That no. is- <laughs> <laughs> that's really over scoping uh, i think so yeah it takes nine months for that for heaven's sake they're building a target demographic and so, <laughs> uh, i will also say just so a um, couple of uh random facts i happen to know so the largest global game jam site in uh in north america is in new york city um and uh the the largest one in the world is actually in north africa uh, in Cairo, in Egypt, they have like over a thousand people that mm -hmm. come to the Global Game Jam site. They used to have one in Cairo and one in Alexandria, and the Alexandria one actually decided to not do it just so they could have everyone go into Cairo <laughs> um, and and just have this huge, I mean, this phenomenal, like that's the, you know, a, a thousand people, right? That's a con, um, mm -hmm. a convention. Uh, I will also say, um, if you're watching this chat and you're like, oh, I haven't participated, I'd be new, all these people I'm sure are much, are much more experienced. Statistically, half of the people that participate in Global Game Jam have been new. Every, every year we see this, like half. So, Which is awesome, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's their first jam, so I just, just go for it. You I think that's alone. one thing. And then the other thing is uh, uh, you, you just don't need fancy software, right? So... Uh, you don't need Photoshop because there's there's tools like uh, you know Kitra and there's Blender and of course there's Unreal Engine which y you can just download and use for free. There's there's all the Quixel tools which are completely free to use. Uh, there's huge libraries of textures and materials and um, uh, HDRI dot org and and things like that that are and uh, what is it. Uh, uh, 3D warehouse and, and places mm -hmm. where you can uh, get full access to tons and tons of content th so that maybe you're not a very good modeler, maybe you are a very good modeler, not a very good texture artist, whatever the case is, maybe, um, maybe, maybe anything, right? So uh, we can make excuses for reasons not to do it, but there are plenty of excuses to do it, right? So uh, the Unreal Engine Marketplace, <clears throat> you know, Mark's going to share with us that there are so many models in there that if you are like, well, I don't have any models to use, 
Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you today in a few minutes how you can take tons of the content in there and just change it, just change it to do whatever you want it to look like. And so, uh, and it's not hard to do it. Uh, you know, I, I always tell people that it, it's harder to, uh, you know, cook a decent meal or change the brakes on a car than it is to use any of these tools, you know? Yep. And I know a lot of people that can do those things much easier than, than I can do this stuff. Um, so it's just a matter of finding a YouTube video to show you how to do it or, or, you know, reading the book or something, you know? The Absolutely. The, the, there was a time when I'm um, doing anything like this <clears throat> was an expensive proposition. Um, the tools have become so incredibly democratized now, not just for, for games, but for film and for so many other creative endeavors. Um, you know, you've got, almost enough in your pocket to start a game jam. You know, with a phone, you could probably do something which would actually work in a game jam. Um, the, the accessibility of the software, certainly the Unreal Engine and Blender is an example of something which is, it's not just a toy. Remember, Blender is actually used in commercial work by a lot of people these days, and it's, its acceptance is growing. Um, and it's free. This, you know, Literally 20 years ago, software was costing, for say 3D Studio Max was about $8,000, I think, wasn't it? About that. Uh, Maya was more. Um, there were people who basically worked in the industry because they, they managed to find somebody who had a box with software on it that they learned. And it was so rare to be able to do that. You have anything you need accessible to you and you have training material, which is really incredibly valuable. Again, one of the reasons why I've got so many books is because when I started doing a lot of this stuff, the internet existed, but there wasn't an awful lot on it. And there certainly wasn't an awful lot about these kind of um, these kind of tools. So today you go onto YouTube, you go onto, um, again, we have Unreal Online Learning. We have a huge amount of stuff there. But you go onto so many other sites that people will share how they do things. And sharing is one of the best things I can suggest anybody who's able to do something as well to get out there and actually share it with the community it helps everyone if you do that absolutely so what a a great segue into what lewis is going to show us yes it's, show us stuff know, as of 426 you, unreal even has modeling tools and then we have this whole quixel thing for texturing and surfacing so now you can literally even not even use a third party modeling package you can you know source most of your models from marketplace or the quixel library and then write in unreal make modifications and come back and forth and that's that's huge and you know in a game jam time saving is everything. And if you can do it right there, it, it's huge. So I'm only just like starting to dabble with the, the modeling tools and the Quixel stuff. And it's, I'm having to like rearrange my entire thought process of production <laughs> and like where I'm doing things. Uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's great, but it's kind of hard for my old brain to readjust and not just go back to, you know, opening up a source file in Max and changing the pivot point by two centimeters, <laughs> re-exporting it back out, bringing it back, and just that's the way I do it. Um, so I'm I'm pretty excited to see uh, what Lewis is going to show us here because, yeah, more. I'd, I'd also um, expect to see quite a few games this year with some of the um, um, landmass kind of. Mm -hmm flows which we've seen in the last couple of weeks at the landmass and the um the the um fluids sort of the the oceans the rivers the, and the you know there's so many very quick procedural ways of working as well which i think are really appropriate for working in game jams so if you if you know some procedural workflows again you can work incredibly quickly and you know quixel is one of those tools that has quite a large amount of proceduralism built into it also absolutely yeah, so before we get started, you know, clarify for us, Seven, uh, there are no rules specifically in Global Game Jam that you cannot uh, use models that you don't make. 
Yeah, a lot of people think the the big point of the game jam is to start from scratch right when you arrive. And I would encourage people to not think that way because um, the, the, the rules, there aren't rules that say you can't do that. And local sites may institute these things, but the the important part is that you're participating, right? Nobody, there, there are no game jam police. Um, and, and you should also just consider if you are one of those people that believe that you need to make everything from scratch when you arrive, what if you didn't? What if you had so much more time to actually make the thing you want to make that you're not spending time on menus? Or like creating the ability to pause if you want to put that or or like just, just all of these really small things that take away from you building the experience which is the most important part perfect all right well let's jump in and take a look at some stuff so i'm gonna open up well i've got it open already so I'm also streaming, so hopefully none of this stuff slows my screen down. But I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I've got some Unreal open here, and I'm going to move this over to the side. And you should see some Unreal engines here. And I created a project that brought in a couple of content packs. Namely, one of them is... Uh, the Hour of Code, which we covered a couple of weeks ago, which is a project that's available for download for free in the free marketplace content. And you can see here a lot of the meshes that are available in there. One of the other content packs that I had downloaded into this project <clears throat> was the Downtown uh, Colorado West project that has a whole bunch of cool meshes. <clears throat> so for the sake of time, because we want to make sure to, to cover all the stuff that everyone else is going to cover, I only selected a couple of meshes here to um, mess around with inside of uh, the Quixel tool set. And in particular, there are these kind of cool mountains that um, in the hour of code are really interesting. And as I was looking at these floating mountains, um, you'll see that they're very interesting. And in uh, many cases, there are two UV channels. Of course, Unreal Engine likes two UV channels. Uh, and if we take a look at them, you know, you've got one uh, for the top and one for the bottom. And of course, if you're doing pre-computed lighting, you need additional UV channels for pre-computed lighting. Well, one of the things uh, that I wanted to do is to combine those mountains and to uh, make a single UV channel. And I brought in my own UV texture. And uh, one of the things you can do now in Unreal Engine is to create uh, your own UVs, which is really powerful and cool. Um, Maybe for the sake of time, I'll just show you what the tool is uh, because you can spend a fair amount of time uh, going through every iteration. There's tons and tons. Now, you have to enable the plugin. You go into the plugins inside of Unreal Engine, and there is a modeling tools. And you can see there's a modeling tools editor mode. So you enable that, and of course, it's going to ask you for a restart of the tool. And then here in the mode section, you will see that there's a modeling tool. Now you get this tool panel, and then you get the ability to create primitives, create, transform, deform, create polygroups, triangles, UVs, and so forth. So one of the things that I did is I brought this in to a level, and I started playing around with it. And you know, once again, I could spend 20 minutes on you know, talking about this tool set, uh, but one of the things that you will want to do in a situation like this is you'll want to create polygroups. Uh, and, you know, you could select the top and create a polygroup for the top and select the bottom. And you get a variety of different tools in here for selecting those things. And then you get a, a UV uh, tool set in here where you can select those polygroups and you can use this group unwrap tool and then you can start massaging and you can actually paint seams. And, and there's good documentation for all this stuff. Uh, after I did all this stuff, I decided uh, that I didn't really want to use this, even though I did a version of it. And I'll show you the version uh, that I did just because I didn't want to use it. I actually wanted to separate the top and bottom. Uh, but I just wanted to discuss that this is completely a viable work form uh, that you can use inside of... Um, 
the engine and you can do your UVing, you can see that it actually does a pretty decent job of laying out UVs inside of here. And, and, you know, given some more time, I would have cleaned this up to the next level. And I wouldn't say that it is currently in version 4.26, you know, uh, as maybe robust as Max and Maya's UV tools, but, you know, it probably will get there knowing the way that uh, uh, our engineers are. Um, so what I actually did <clears throat> is that you will see in, in this particular um, content pack that the island has been separated and there is a top to the bottom, and that's what I exported. And the way that you do that is you can select it and you can right click and you can say asset actions export and it gives you the option here of exporting it and I exported the FBX uh, and if I say let me just call this version three or something like that and then you get your export oh there's my dialog box on the other screen it fools me every time and then I pretty much turn everything off because it'll uh, when you export something like this into uh, the Quixel Mixer, uh, you don't want to have level of detail meshes. You don't want your collisions. Uh, primarily, you don't want those extra meshes. You can bring in vertex colors, but you don't necessarily need it. You won't use it. You don't want more targets if there were any associated. Basically, I turn all that stuff off. And then I have an FBX file that you can bring in to Mixer. Uh, and I did the same thing for the top. And then the other thing that I did is I went here to the downtown west uh, and I was looking for some interesting stuff. And I found a couple of models that I also wanted to bring in because what I did do is I sort of assembled a little scene with some of these elements as sort of a, a bit of a game jam environment. And one of the ones that I brought was this bunny and this tortoise that I thought were kind of interesting. And once again, because you get to cherry pick from huge collections of assets, you know, why not uh, manipulate and pick a bunch of stuff, export it as an FBX file, bring it into Mixer, retexture it. And once again, you'll notice that this stuff is, you know, fairly realistically made. So my goal was to bring it into Mixer and make it fairly stylized. And you can see that there's this cool deer and these cool statues that are, you know, very metallic and, and style in nature. So uh, that's the initial part of what I did here, and then I'll bring it back into Unreal Engine in a moment. Now, the next step is to bring it into Mixer. Now, before I actually open those things up, what I want to do is take you through, uh, you know, for those of you who have not spent much time in Mixer, there are basically three tools that, uh, the but there's basically two tools that Quixel offers for download and use. One, one is Bridge. And Bridge is an actual application that allows you to browse the Megascans library with your Epic ID and allows you to browse that library and actually uh, export 3D assets and 2D assets from all the whole Megascans library directly into Unreal Engine, any version of Unreal Engine, and provide a plugin uh, to Unreal Engine uh, but also to other pieces of 3D software so that you can very easily access uh, the, the Quixel Megascans library. And this is Quixel Mixer. And Quixel Mixer is a very powerful tool where you also have access to that online library, but you can bring it into Mixer and then you can modify it and, and have a fully procedural stack that is non-destructive that you can change all of those textures and then export those textures and import those textures uh, into Unreal Engine or any other tool that you want um, after you've modified them in a variety of different ways. So before I really get into um, opening up the assets that I created, I'm going to just do a quick, you know, demo of showing you and I'll call it my new demo so that I don't get any naming and show you basically how to work in 3D in something like Mixer for those of you who have never really worked in it. Now, when you open it for the very first time, uh, you're working basically in a 2D plane, but you can very quickly and easily move to 3D. And then it'll ask you, well, what 3D asset that you want to work with? I'm going to open up this Japanese stone lantern. 
And one of the really cool things is that anything that you do, you can save all the work that you did and then bring it over to any other asset. And that's a really powerful thing. So now, you know, I've got a 3D asset and this is actually a a uh, photogrammetry scan from a trip that uh, the Quixel team did to Japan. And if I hold my shift key, I can move the light around in here and take a look at it and use my mouse wheel to zoom in and out. And then I go over to the layer stack and there's the base version of it. Now to start trying to stylize uh, something like this, what I want to do is knock off most of the realistic stuff off of it, right? So I might actually go to the normal map and you can see here on the right side, I've got the albedo, metalness, roughness, displacement, and normal, and start to reduce, for instance, a lot of the, the actual um, surface information like the displacement and sort of reduce that stuff uh, so that it's not quite as overbearing. So I might reduce the strength of the normal and the opacity and maybe even put in a base gray layer so that you can see that I've taken some of that information away. Uh, it's not quite as um, refined and tight. And then I might even add on top of that uh, a rock layer. So when I click on create a new layer, I created a solid layer and I can create a solid layer. I can go and grab a material from a local library or an online library. And if I go to the online library, you can see that I can go and get anything uh, from the Megascans library. And all I've done here is logged in with the same Epic ID that I log into uh, the Epic Games Launcher. So I can get any Surface, Brush, Atlas, or 3D model. Uh, I've already downloaded a bunch of them to my local library, so I can go and find some kind of a rock. And maybe I'll get some nice lumpy rock to put on top of it. Maybe this, uh, what is this? Let's see what it brings up. Actually, it's mossy rock. And you can see that it brings on some mossy rock. And one of the very first things that I can do is open up the placement section here, and I can reduce the scale of it. So it just gives me some disturbance on top of it and it gives me some uniform disturbance on top of it and I can also go in and change the albedo color to give me more of a baseline to work from and I might already start making it a more interesting unusual color and the other thing that I might want to do to it is to go ahead and change uh, the way that it represents this thing so if I want to get procedural on it right away I can go down to the very bottom here where I can create what's known as a layer stack. And if I click on that layer stack, I have these two little drop downs in the top right where I can start manipulating this layer that I put on it, this lumpy rock. And one of the very first things I might want to do is to go ahead and put a gradient, a position gradient, so that this lumpy rock is only affected as a gradient, either from top to bottom, left to right, in any one direction or another. And right now, you'll notice here in the top left that I'm looking at it in full PBR mode, uh, but I can look at it in a variety of different ways. I can look at the albedo, I can look at the roughness, normal. You know, if I go to normal mode, this is the normal on that surface. One of the ways that is really helpful to look at it is to look at it in just the mask activity. And that's nine on your keyboard. So I can just see what this position gradient is doing. And so what that position gradient is actually doing is just letting that rock affect a portion of the mesh. So if I go back, you can see that the bottom is not being affected by the rock, but just the top is being affected by that rock. So I can put that position gradient and I've got a range slider on the bottom and I can actually change that range slider and it changes how that influence actually works. And it's got a top end and a bottom end. And if I hit the nine key, you can see that I can tighten it or loosen it, right? So in many ways, anyone who's used Photoshop is already familiar with a lot of these tools. So if I go back to one, you can see I can zero in. And if I hold down the shift key, I can slide the whole thing up or down. So I can sort of zero in that influence a little bit. And then what I can do if I want to even mess with it a little bit more is to go ahead and put uh, a radiant, a gradient remap on top of it. And this allows me to either tile that influence a little bit more or change the range of it a little bit more 
So this is basically amplifying this range or change the way that curve moves up and down. So this allows me to repeat it if I want to. And sometimes I will put a gradient remap just to amplify the effect of that range. And then on top of that, I can put another thing that I like to put on, which is a brightness and contrast. So if I want to brighten the whole effect and add some contrast, and if we look at this once again in just the way that it's working, it allows me to just dial in a variety of those effects. And one of the other things that's really powerful is if I go back to my gradient remap, I can change the way that that channel is actually being applied. Once again, this is very similar to Photoshop. So maybe I want this layer to affect my gradient position, not just as a normal, but as an add. So you can see that I can change the way that the gradient remap is a being applied very specifically to the channel below. So in many ways, when I'm building a stack, a procedural stack like this, I might actually experiment and say, well, what happens if I divide this effect? You know, does it give me much more of a rigid uh, attachment here? And if you really want to have a hard line, uh, you can actually, or a series of hard lines, you can actually play with this effect a little bit more and get some really interesting sort of divisions moving in there. So we start working with something like this, and then we start working and in moving into the next place. Uh, so now we want to give another solid layer, and we might color this layer a little bit differently. Uh, and I'll go into my albedo and give this something really kind of obnoxious, like a nice bright yellow. And what I'm going to do with this is add another layer stack to it. And this time, I'm actually going to give it a curvature. Now, a curvature is kind of interesting, because if I go in, once again, and hit the 9 key, what this is going to do is going to go in and find the edges of my mesh. And so I can start to, once again, change the gradient slider, or the level slider, and I can go in and just find the actual curvature of the mesh. And if I hit once again, I can actually highlight the outer edges. And I think I probably did a little too harsh of a job. So I might smooth this out. And one thing that you can always do is turn off some of these layer masks to smooth out the effect. I mean, already just being able to pick out the edges like that, paint them. It's crazy, already, right? You've moved into, moved away from photo reel right into stylized. Super stylized. And that's, no, I, love I it. mean, it even kind of looks like brush marks. I had no idea that you could, you know, do this directly in, in, in Mixer. You yeah, know, absolutely. I thought that I still had to take the models out fake out curvature maps, fake out AO maps, and then bring them in and use those. But having it right here is just super amazing. And yeah, I can just imagine taking pretty much anything like this. And now it, who would ever know that that started as a photorealistic scan with 12 trillion triangles. <laughs> and now it looks like uh, it's ready to drop into your cartoono game. So now I'm going to put another one on and I'm going to polarize it. The polarize does some really cool stuff to a mesh. And then if you polarize something and then you also add on top of it and this as you go and and sort of learn a little bit more as you polarize something and you start to add a little bit of more noise to it and add some more frequency something we've got a couple of different noises in here we've got perlin simplex whirly one, two, and three, and you start to add a little bit of more octaves and lacunarities, we get some really interesting effects, especially if we go in and change instead of being normal. Uh, you can add a variety of different ways that it gets applied. We can do adds, we can add multiplies, but one of the really cool ones is this distortion, right? Because as we distort and polarize and start to change the way that we distort this, we get this really crazy effect that occurs on a surface. And so we can get this 
really gnarly sort of effect that if we then go back to the base mesh and start to play with maybe not the metalness but the roughness we can get this crazy metallic looking sort of a swirl pattern that gets applied on top of the surface especially if we apply that also to something like the roughness of the edges that we highlighted on the layer before and if we start to shine the light we can start to really manipulate these edges on top of the fact that right now by default the blend modes are coming in as masked but if we decide to change the blend modes from something like above or below and start to mess around with the way that these things are coming in or out and play with the threshold a little bit we can really start to pull or push these in or out of the surface especially like something like the solid layers above and below and so we can really get some very interesting type of distortions to occur with those metallic bits that we are or you know shiny bits in any case that we are adding to come through the bottom or top and you can see there that you can right away get some crazy really stylized looking stuff now as i'm doing that if i go in and add another layer i can find the same inset right so let's say i find one more and maybe give it another fairly unusual tone I'm going to show you the, the finished in a minute here. I can actually go in and find, give it another curvature. And one of the things is that I can apply that curvature just to the mesh and just find the cavities, right? So when you're doing this, you can do default curvature but you can also just identify the cavities of a mesh as well and this gets really interesting because i can find the outer edges but i can find the inner edges of a mesh as well so now if i go in here and make this a little bit more interesting and bright i can really get some pretty dynamic and interesting and once again you know i'm not being very deliberate about the colors that i'm choosing i'm just trying to make something somewhat stylized and wolf we'll, you know you can go in and change because of how non-destructive this process is and by basically amplifying and playing with what are basically photoshop you know any image editing tool you, know, you can heighten the brightness and stretch and, and pull on any one of these values. Um, now, what, where this gets really exciting is that after you've edited all this and named it properly, of course, I'm being somewhat quick here, I can shift select all of these, add them to a group, and I can rename this group something like, I don't know, rename this layer, my new tune thing and then i can right click and i can export this as what's known as a smart material but then i get a dialog box and says well what do you want to call this i'll call this my new smart material and i can export it now at any point if i want to i can delete my new smart material here So you say. Yes, apparently not. But then I can also go in and create a brand new layer and then go in and get a whole series of smart materials. So here's the one that I just created, my new tune material. Here's one that I created earlier. And look how interestingly stylized such a thing can be, right? And so here's the variety of those layers again. So this is where it gets really kind of interesting because you can save all of these things that you want but where it gets super powerful is that i can go in and just change the model so let's change the model to this japanese cat statue thing 
and look what it does. It applies the same layer stack to that other mesh. So let's say you're making a game jam game where you need all these unique assets to have that same style applied to them. Here it is. Now, asset after asset, you apply this thing. You go to the export setting. You say, well, here's my content. Here's my new, you know, cat mesh statue. Export it, export resolution. I want the diffuse, albedo, specular, blah, blah, blah. And you export all the variety of textures that you want for this thing. Cool, happy. Got what I need. Then you're like, now I need to apply it to the, what do you call it? How about this thing? And again, because you're working in a jam here, <clears throat> You can share these with your, your friends, your colleagues, your teammates. Yes, that's really cool. So, you know, and once again, this is non-destructive. So let's say, well, you know, that didn't look as good on this thing. So I can go in here and change, for instance, the way that the curvature is being applied to this thing. So let's go into the scatter map and change the range of the scatter map. So this thing is actually applying a, a, a scatter modifier, and you've got full control over the full stack. And this is what's really powerful about it. So I can go back in, and you can resave your material. So if you didn't like the way that it applied it to a certain mesh, it's fully non-destructive. So I can change the way that it applies the noise, the frequency, all that stuff is completely editable. Or you can just shut off the layer and say, well, you know, what does it look like now? You know, well, I don't like that at all. Let's turn that on. Mm, or maybe change the color. Maybe you're, you're like, well, I'm really done with that base layer. Let's shift it over to, you know, something a little bit more, more grotesque. <laughs> uh, so having said that, the other thing that is completely your option is that, let me show you this, you can not cancel, but say new. Okay, new, no, don't save the changes. Instead of working with an existing 3D asset is where you get to bring in your custom mesh. And so this is where I brought in, for instance, my floating island. And this is that island that we looked at a minute ago in Unreal Engine. So once again, this is uh, one of these islands, right? So I grabbed one of these islands. I exported it as an FBX. And here it is. And so once again, you can go through that whole operation that I just showed you. Or once you've already created a smart material for it, uh, you can create a new layer. You know, and that's one of the nice things about experimenting on existing content, then building your own smart material, and then applying your own smart material. So I think it might be this. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, look at that. And so once again, it's fully non-destructive. So you can go in, manipulate the colors, change all of it. So I did all that. And then what you get at the end is a series of textures, right? So um, let me see here, which one is it? And I exported all the textures from Quixel Mixer. And here are basically the textures that I exported from Mixer for the island, and you can see that it's got a variety of different noise patterns. And I did the same thing to uh, ground, and you can export, a, in some cases, more than you may want. You can export albedo, diffuse, AO, roughness, normal, specular, uh, displacement. 
Um, and then let me show you a little scene that I built inside of the engine using this content. And of course, this is maybe just a couple of hours in an afternoon of work. So you turned a rock into a meat crystal. Yes. So, Whoa. There you go. Yes. Kind I of still nutty. think jello. jello, it's jello. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's uh, the the turtle from the the new set pack that just came out, and the bunny, and the the mountain turned upside down, and then the top of the mountain. And so, once again, I think there's a a perception at times that using tools like Mixer is really highly focused on photorealistic content, but you can, you can be very non photorealistic inside of these tools, uh, which is pretty awesome. So if I go back and I open up the turtle, you can see just how cool you can make some of this stuff. Look at that. Ooh, that's pretty. I think that reminds me of a nightclub I was in Berlin one time. That would be nice 3D printed <laughs> on my coffee table. Or it would make a nice dessert, something like that. Mm -hmm. And again, I think for uh, for game jams, it's probably a really good thing to... Well, it's it's a way to go to work non real. Obviously, Unreal is capable of doing a huge amount of stuff that is photorealistic, but photorealism is, it takes a lot to get that last couple of percent to actually make it look really right. And game jams, you know, that you may not have that time. So if you're working in a, a concept which is more um, fantastic, I, I think it's a, a potential way to actually to, to benefit from all these workflows, mm -hmm. to do things that people haven't seen before as well. Aids yeah. creativity. You get some really yeah. interesting patterns with the, you know, this combination of polarizing a surface, um, blurring noise. You know, it's this combination of uh, position gradient, and then here, if we take a look just really quickly, and then I will, uh, you know, I find the edges. Uh, I basically will do a little bit of noise, and then the combination of noise with distortion is really quite magical. And then the swirlies are uh, pretty awesome. So, you know, if you're interested in doing something like this, uh, what Mark is going to share with you uh, in a minute about the variety of Unreal Engine content that you can do some of the stuff with is really, really cool. So, yeah. So the other thing uh, that this kind of solves for is the issue of I got all my content from all of these places that Mark's going to show me and it all looks different and it all kind of, you know, has a different style or this was photo scanned and this was hand painted. And, uh, I put them all into my scene and they look not good together. Even just giving everything, uh, you know, a coat of similarity um, can really help you know and it's all about saving time like if you can just go grab a model of a head and go oh i don't care that it's super photorealistic i'm gonna whack all that detail off and throw some stuff on there in a couple of seconds that's so much that just opens up the <laughs> the, the possibilities and, and being able to grab your own stuff and bring it in there or lean on the content that's already there so cool I had never really considered Quixel Mixer and Quixel in general as a source for stylized. It just, you know, I looked at libraries of photoreal stuff and my brain went, that's photoreal. So that is so cool to see. I'm going to be putting edges on everything now. Well, then if you, once again, yeah. if you have done some Photoshop work and you go in there and you're like, oh, this is just a range slider and, and this is just, you know, multiply, add, subtract, divide, and this is just brightness and contrast and this is how i find an edge and this is how i you know put a ramp on something you already know most of this stuff which is super cool and again agreeing with tom there in terms of putting similarity across things um 
first time I realized how many different shades of green there were was when you actually take a whole bunch of assets, which you've got photo real, you know, reference or models for, and you put them all in the one scene and think, why do they all look terrible together? <laughs> because they're just not working together. Um, there's clashes that they were photographed in different quality of light and all this kind of stuff. And it can be quite a, a, a time-consuming effort to, to bring them together to actually make it into a coherent space, to make it into something which actually looks like it's all in the same world. And with the ability to do this kind of work in, in Quixel, it really helps. Really? I, my mind is blown. I knew, like, I, you know, we've seen, uh, we've all worked with uh, Galen Davis and we've seen his presentations on Mixer, um, but just, just seeing... I don't know. This felt felt different. Like my mind is a flutter. I want to bust open mixer right now. I'm gonna wait till the end of the stream. <laughs> wait till the end of the stream. That's the whole point. Everyone can I might do be it. Updating my copy right now. <laughs> There's a new update today. Yes. <laughs> so it tells me. Cool. Well, let's let's move on. I think we've got. Uh, hopefully, I didn't take up too much time there. That was awesome. I, I well, think it was awesome. Yeah. So shall I share my screen? Please. Certainly. Let's hope I've got the right screen sharing and I don't need audio. No, I don't. So yes, as um, Lewis just showed you, there's an awful lot of phenomenal things you can actually get from Quixel. And you got an Unreal license, you basically have access to everything that we have in the um, Quixel library. Currently, 14,374 assets. It'll probably be more by next week. We're adding stuff every week. The latest ones are Middle Eastern floors and culinary herbs, which are for now. Oh, sorry, Nordic classical modular building. <gasps> That's going to be fantastic. Oh, yes. That's a new classical building that you can put together entire um, scenes using these. So, <laughs> yeah, Quixel has fantastic, high resolution, beautifully detailed, based on Photoscan um, models, which you can use freely throughout any any jam. But we have an awful lot of other sources. And you may not guess, but I, I like collecting things. I like libraries. And at Unreal, we actually give away an awful lot of free content, sometimes with a particular intention. And we actually did this a couple of years ago for Game Jams. We put together a Game Jam toolkit, which is possibly a way which you can you can look at what's in this and think, okay, if I'm going to a game jam, I can either use this toolkit or I can build my own little toolkit to bring with me, which could be a good idea, which has mm. stuff pre-rolled and ready for you to take in. These are the kind of things which I want to work on. Um, I have particular ideas or particular models, which I think could be useful. And again, you don't know necessarily what the theme of the game jam will be. So you can't go in there and just make the game which you've thought of before and say, oh, yeah, I'm making this game. It has to work with the theme. So you can have textures, which you like. You can have reference, which you like, all these kind of things. And there are some things which are always going to be useful. In the Game Jam Toolkit here, for instance, we have some flares, and we have you know some materials, and we've got some models. And I actually loaded this up in Unreal, if I can get Unreal open here. So this was made a couple of years ago, but it still actually works in um, Unreal 426, which is my latest build. And there's actually a full game built within it. So this is a little, I'm terrible at playing this game, so don't ask me to to get any high scores. But there's a little game here that you can actually fly through and do things. I made it through that far, and I crashed. Um, so it actually has blueprints. It has weapons. We can have a look down here and see what's in here. There's blueprints um, for the room. There's the materials. There's meshes. Um, there's effects and explosions and all kinds of other stuff, which, yeah, you could make them while you're at the game jam, but bring them with you and use them for the things you want to do, especially some of the aspects that are going to be in, in every game. Um, I would say some of the UMG-type HUD frameworks will be incredibly valuable to you. Um, building a decent HUD, building decent scoring systems, these kind of things are going to be pretty similar across an awful lot of get different game types. So bring them with you and implement them. The game jam, in most cases, is looking for something which is fun. And <laughs> building a HUD and building a, um, a scoring system is not necessarily a fun thing to do. 
it's it's useful to be able to see it in your game, but you can actually spend more time polishing the, the feel and the mechanic of your game rather than building these things. Um, if you're interested in this particular file, I think Tom can drop the um, the link into the into the, the, the Twitch. Um, one thing which I would suggest is I tried to load the file just by clicking on it and it had an issue doing that. If you do have a problem with that, just load Unreal and browse to the file and it, it tends to load more easily. Um, excellent examples of how things are done and you know you can even use this in teaching that's one of the things that this could be useful to you as well in education because it's an education live stream there's a game here you can take that apart and you can actually show it's a very simple um ufo game take it apart you can get people to actually figure out how it was made and replicate it um simple games of this type are really really useful to educators because the the act of dissection is obviously a great way of learning how other people have put things together. So it has that secondary purpose for education. Now, that, that was definitely part of why we built it was yeah. to, to demonstrate, um, you know, not, it's, it's hard to do best practices in Unreal. You can kind of do not worst practices. Um, so to demonstrate the not worst practices uh, and, and, you know, like some folks have said in the chat, like HUDs are kind of the same. Pause, <laughs> pause menu. menu. You've got to resume, quit, main menu. Um, yep. You know, maybe even if you don't feel good about like just taking the code and copy pasting it, at least having an idea of, oh yeah, I need a pause menu. I need a start menu. And you know, I've judged game jams yep. and just having those niceties um, you know, a game that starts and has a game over and goes back to a menu that really helps when you're judging <laughs> yep. the game kind of works like a game. Um, and really, you know, uh, you can have all your game working, but if your player doesn't know the score or doesn't know when the level's over or if they've won or not, then it, 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 it you know, you could have an award, you know, the winning game, but the judges don't know if, you know, something has <laughs> happened and that's it. Um, so, you know, often I find that like HUDs uh, are one of the last things people kind of think about, but they're really so important for community there. And, and, you know, Unreal has like 30 ways to do things. So I wanted to, yeah. to have a show. UI There's and audio, there. right? <laughs> UI and audio. Oh, we, for, we audio forgot there. UI and audio. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, pick a, a good audio person for your, your game jam as well. They're always, always at a premium. Um, I've, I've seen some audio programmers actually work across different teams because they're so valuable. Um, there's obviously as well within our Unreal tab here in the Epic Games Launcher, we have the Marketplace, which has fantastic um, materials you can use, a lot of which are actually free. So the free collections, as I said, I'm a collector. I've got a library, which I'll show you in a second, of stuff that I've got in the monthly, free for the month. But the permanently free collection has an awful lot of really, really valuable stuff for you as well. This it tends to be um, either epic creation content or content which we see as so valuable that we want to make sure it's there for our users to have access to permanently. Um, so rather than actually going through here, which I can't actually get everything into the the one um, one window. I've got the um, the Chrome version of it here open in front of me, and we can see this is sorted by newest first. And yeah, I would advise probably the newest assets are probably going to be more interesting to you, but a lot of the materials that go back a long time are still going to be really, really cool for you to work with. I would advise for, if you're going to a game jam, probably best to have these things, um, you know, purchased and downloaded beforehand. Don't try and do that with your Quixel assets, um, but it just, it can take some time, particularly in a physical game jam. Access to internets tend to be quite slow. So this year won't be so bad, but if you're going to a physical game jam, um, have things loaded on your PC, it will help you. Um, don't try and download all of Quixel's library mm. because <laughs> we have a- You mean 14,000 things? 
Don't at, download. At sort of 8K textures, no. Um, but these assets are are all game ready, and they're all um, at resolutions which will be quite usable for you. So there's a, a lot of really cool things in here. Recently, we've started to do these these packs at the city park, um, the downtown. Um, That's where the turtle Davis came Colorado. from. Colorado. Yep. Um, and also this factory environment, which I think is really cool. Yeah. And if we just click on any one of these, you'll see that when you go in here, you actually have some images. You've got reviews of what people think about them. Um, but if you go through the images, you'll see the way in which these have been used. You could build entire games just using this one pack, and you know it would be quite interesting to do so. But it's also worthwhile having a look at a lot of them have trailers, which are videos of the things in play and some gameplay with them as well. So you can see clicking on these will show some gameplay using these assets. Again, probably not going to stream so well from here, but I advise you to to go to the marketplace and actually find these and look through them to find the ones that you think will be useful to you. Um, with many of these, for instance, they will be demonstrating very up-to-date features. This is using Niagara, which is obviously pretty much of the moment. And Niagara Footprints, and it will actually include particles for dirt and mud, grass, gravel, all these kind of different materials, which you can be walking in. It has 15 particle systems, and it's optimized to run in good frame rates. What you can do as well, though, it's worthwhile to have a look at UE Marketplace support site, because people have set questions about using these. Um, have a look at some of the, the topics here. And again, if you have any questions, customer articles will tell you. Um, people have asked in the past, can I modify the products that I purchased? And the answer is yes. Under the license which Marketplace has for all of these, you're free to modify any product to purchase from the Marketplace. Getting it for free is still purchasing it. You've still got to go through a purchase operation. Can I share products with my team? And the answer to that is yes. You can share the Marketplace place products with your team for limited purpose and uh, projects within the development team but it's not something you should be putting back online it should be definitely shared just locally with your team for specific pro projects um and how can i use the pro products i've purchased um from the marketplace learn tab besides using them in learning experiment and prototyping you can use them for shipped projects as well so that's that's perfectly acceptable with this with game jams, good practice in general is to give credit to where your materials come from. Um, some people or some game jams will have that as part of their the rules. Um, it it just makes general sense as well that somebody has put time and effort and made beautiful stuff which you find useful. It's a good way of thanking them to actually go out there and say that. Um, say so this was made using these and try and keep track of the assets you put into your game as well because. It is possible at some point that you may find something has crept in there that you don't necessarily have the right to. If you control that, and again, sort of putting this on, on uh, Tom as well, if you have everything in your Perforce, then you can actually say that all the stuff has been taken from here, it's been put in Perforce, nothing gets into the game that hasn't actually gone through there. That's probably going to be very useful for you. Very bad surprise can come to you at some point if you've put something into your game that you don't have a license for. So be careful of that too. Um, Real quick, Mark, uh, I want to uh, comment on a comment in the, the chat here about um, plugins. So on the marketplace, we have some paid plugins. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are code plugins um, uh, and, and so those, their licensing can be different. So if they are using a licensing server like V-Ray or, uh, you know, some of the, the you know, the commercial products that you can buy through the marketplace, you'll have to live by their licensing rules. Yes. Um, so if it's a content pack, so, and that includes a lot of like blueprint code and C++ code. Um, so you kind of have to check with each each pack because there are some things uh, that we consider you can see here these are called code plugins mm -hmm. um, and those code plugins we do allow those developers to have separate licensing schemes um, uh, typically speaking you'll see it like this where the plugin will be free 
and you try and use the plugin and it'll contact the licensing server or ask for a license at that point that's kind of uh beyond our control but we put them on the marketplace because it's so much easier to maintain and discover so um, it's it's one of the best ways which we can actually distribute yes so um, you know by and large if uh, there isn't a license server attached to it you can share it with your team but like you know, they can't then take that after the game jam and yep you, it's specific to the rid of it. <laughs> um one of the, the sort of plug-in type things we have here is level design assistant which again has lots of valuable tools not just for game jams but for for general working um it has ways of basically populating with different types of grids and layouts and um advise lots of people to actually it's get great the level tool. Down. it's amazing tool. yeah and really worthwhile. It's one of the ones that's in here because people of Epic like it and think that everybody would benefit from using it. Um, so again, that's something which don't just think of this entirely for your game jam. Think of it. These are things I want to use from now on. Um, so many things you can do using things like your um, vehicle packs and vegetation packs. There's a lot of really phenomenal vegetation packs Obviously, Quixel has quite a lot of um, scan materials for uh, for earth and for bark and for other things which will fit with your um, with a natural environment. But in currently, we don't actually have, for instance, um, very many trees or very many um, bushes within this. So you get full forest packs here that you get right. temperate veg vegetation for spruce, etc. Which you know these are beautiful assets which will work very well with the rest of the Quixel tools currently. And, and they're again, generic. Have, I think that's a good thing, yeah. is it? You know, they're mostly generic and, and uh, they work in many different types of games. The kind of assets which you'll be using all the time, like um, Decagon, again, we've had on the show previously, and um, they produce great stuff. And these kind of little treasure things are phenomenal. Um, we've got the fantasy weapons and animal variety pack. It's just even in this one small section, which is the permanently free, we have a lot of great stuff. And um, craft resource icons, again, you could spend a couple of hours thinking about how am I actually going to show this as a crafting um, icon, whereas this will certainly do you for a game jam. If, as many people do, you want to take the game later and develop it as something which commercializes, then, yeah, you can you can make your own one. But again, these are usable all the way through to actually to the level of publishing that you are licensed to do that. With the um, the free, permanently free collection is obviously going to be very valuable to you if you haven't started collecting so far. But I highly recommend to people to be a hoarder like I am um, and get as many of these things as you can because you don't know someday you will actually need them. Um, so if I just go down here to my my vault, and let's maximize this a little bit. You can see through the months, okay. uh, it's just taking a while to actually load now. <laughs> um, through the months, you can actually develop a lot of excellent stuff. Why is control. yours so small? <laughs> You're because I haven't been here as long as you have. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my desktop PC, my, my non-Epic PC has lots more. This is my Epic PC. <laughs> But there's fantastic stuff like talent tree, skill tree builders and teleportation portals and all these other things, which they're not permanently free, but keep an eye out for every month. There's more free stuff, and it's hugely worth your while to, to start building a collection. Mm -hmm. And, and again, when you get it, if, you, if it's free for the month and you put it in your cart and you check out, that's yep. tied to your account now. And, and it's mine. It's not you can use nice. it for any projects moving forward. So, yeah, totally yes. take the time each month and get your free content. And just even if you're not going to use it, that's just every month. I'm like, you, 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 you. And now we even have like a cart so you can check it all out at once. Um, yep. And then it's like, it's free. And you say, check out <laughs> and um and then it's yours for you know uh from now until eternity uh which is that's really key because i've made the mistake too of leaving it in my cart i made that mistake one month and i come back and i'm like oh there's four hundred dollars with this stuff in my cart that i could have 
<laughs> it could have had for free yesterday, yes. <laughs> but again, there's an educational aspect to this because the all of the stuff that actually gets into the um, the store, and particularly stuff which is chosen for the the monthly free, tends to be um, top notch. It tends to be stuff which has been well researched by our team, and it's put monthly free for a reason that it's actually seen to be excellent. Um, and open up these assets and have a look at them and see how they work because you will learn an awful lot by doing that. And again, quite often when I'm doing demos, I'll actually show, well, this is somebody who's done this thing here. And the reason why I've done it is because this, I can, at times when I've got time, I can put stuff together myself and say, for instance, build a, a model of a thing. But an awful lot of the time, if I've had somebody else who's done that thing excellently, and I'm, I'm demonstrating something, it's so much easier to actually use a, an asset from here. I think we've, we've all done that. And as, as teachers, we have limited time to actually prepare for lessons. So again, all this stuff here from the teaching perspective is phenomenal. For game jams, have it all ready I, and I want to hand. outline a problem I have. I have a work account and a personal account. Oh. So that so means every month I have to download on both my accounts so that I have them for both, uh, which, you know, is, is a, I know that's a third world problem. I mean, that's a first world <laughs> first problem. World. Sorry. That's yeah, a first I world know. problem, but uh, you know, I just want you all to feel a little sorry. For I, me. Yeah. I, I think someday it would be good to be able to have a, a portable wallet type thing with this would be great. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Mark, really quick. Can you go to the learn tab here? Yes, of course. Well? Uh, just to uh, acknowledge, can you scroll down to the game section? Uh, just so you all know, all of these things are also yep. secret marketplace uh, items of all of the projects that we've done that have a lot of great stuff. And you scroll down a little more to the next section, uh, right here where it says games. If yes. you are still in the mindset that, oh, I want to make my own stuff because professionals make their own stuff. Shooter game right here, this third project, there are so many commercial games that have been released that if you go into the files, it's actually just called shootergame.exe because they use <laughs> this template to start making their game. Professional Again, games. There's Internally, the we still use shooter game to yeah. test functionality because it's a super solid multiplayer c plus plus based multiplayer game and when we come up with some new feature then we're like can someone add this to a game we try and again? get it to work in in there and it's a it's a great proving ground because we know that the, the actual game itself uh is solid and then it's up to us to break it and again this is optimized for xbox one playstation 4 so seeing um kind of a workflow that has that within it is something which is, it's generally really valuable. It's not something which you're going to get many other places. See a, a game which is actually designed specifically to be optimized for those kind of platforms. And this is uh, this is C++ too. A lot of yep. people say if they want more C++ examples, this is a huge online multiplayer project on C++. Yep. Um, cool. And again, even just the artwork in this is fantastic. Um, so yeah, I, I, think I, I don't want to run out of time. So uh, shall we? Tom. Yes. Oh. I will oh, time. Yes. That time. Old. We still have time in this. If you could in put it in world. a bottle. Uh, uh, yeah, and then put it on the marketplace. Yes, we you have to purchase it. <laughs> That's how you become the rich man. Uh, these are, these are really awesome resources. Um, I've actually got a list of, uh, just a ton of additional resources too, that I've compiled. Um, and me and Mark will take our lists and compile them and, uh, we will post them onto the forum for this, this stream, um, which, uh, we can post the link to that here shortly. And, um, so after this stream, we'll get together and get all of these links together um, and put them in there uh, for quick reference back. Um, same for, uh, you know, some of the stuff that Lewis covered, um, as well as some of the stuff that I'll cover. 
UE5 will use C++++. Ooh, that's a hot take. That's, uh... <laughs> that is better. <laughs> that, that is better. It has to be. There's more pluses. I'm going to send that to the engineering team. I don't know that they've thought of adding. It Mine goes to 11. <laughs> For those of you who know um, the movie reference. Final tap. The reference. That's the one. <laughs> Well, cool. So I guess I guess it's on to me with the with the awkward uh, transition here. So bam, from from content to perforce. But this answers this is going to help answer a few of the questions here, which is how do I share this stuff with my team? And I got it from the marketplace, and now I formed a team. How do we get together? And so the way we do that normally is through what we call source control. Um, and so I guess I'll start kind of, what is source control? Um, source control is software that helps you version files and share them to a distributed team. So essentially source control typically means it's a server somewhere uh, that does file management uh, and file serving, um, but it's organized in such a way teams can work together to share files in a very kind of methodical way. So it's a piece of software that allows teams to share files, and share changes to those files over time. Kind of weird. It's kind of like, kind of like a, a Google Drive or a Box Drive where everyone can access the same stuff. Where, but in like Google Drive, as soon as you change a file, it just changes. And every time you change a file, everyone gets the updates, which is cool. Um, and it kind of works for game dev until it really doesn't. So the big problem with that sort of setup is it's great if everyone's working on their own file or you know, if you're working on Google Docs, they're designed where you can all work together. Uh, it doesn't work so well once you open up a Photoshop file and both people make changes at the same time. Now, whoever saved last is going to be the changes that are there. And if you saved before that person, your changes are clobbered. And so source control helps solve for that. So it gives you this shared data that everyone on the team can access, but you can only really effectively one person can edit a file at a time. And they and when they do, they they lock that file or they check out that file. So other people on the team know, oh, Jim is working on this file. I can't work on it yet. And then when Jim checks the file back into the server, Jim provides a comment and the rest of the team can see that Jim is done with the Photoshop file and what they've done with it. And then they choose when they get the download. That's the other thing that's not great. If you're game developing and your files change and they don't change all at the same time or in the right order, you're gonna end up with problems. Um, and in Unreal, we use references for everything. References literally just, we're expecting a file at a specific place with a name on your hard drive. And if it's not there, then Unreal doesn't really know what to do. <laughs> and if it's a running game, it, it crashes. Or if you're in the editor, you end up with all these missing asset things. And um, so what source control does is it provides a framework to getting everyone on the same page, and being able to control when they receive updates and when they send updates up, which is really essential uh, for game development. So what I'm gonna show you here is how to set this up yourself. Because there's a bunch of source control out there. Uh, there's SVN, there's Git, there's Perforce, there's Plastic SCM, there's a bunch of stuff out there. Um, and they all have their pros and cons. SVN is free, it's open source, but it's not very fast. Um, and it takes a lot of local hard drive space, especially if you're working on a uh, a large project. Um, so it's it's pretty good, not bad. Uh, you've got Perforce, which is probably the most used within game development, but it's commercial and it's pretty expensive, but it has a free version, which is perfect for Game Jam. 
because it's free for up to five users. And I, I don't think it's like a global game jam rule, but typically in the game jams I've worked in, there's a team limit size and it tends to be around four or five. Um, some don't have a limit, but um, you know, as long as you're within that, you can, you can use it. And, and so Perforce gives you a little more speed, a little better integration into some of the art tools and stuff. Um, it, and also some better documentation because, you know, it's a commercial product and it can afford to hire technical writers. Um, so let me get started here. I'm going to, so what we're going to do is we're going to just set up a Perfor server on Amazon for total freeness. And so Amazon has a free tier and the free tier uh, is pretty limited, but it gives you access to a virtual server with one CPU and one gigabyte of RAM and 30 gigabytes of hard drive space. But that's pretty good for a game jam, uh, unless you're building some crazy, crazy game or using all of the Quixel assets, <laughs> that 30 gigs will work pretty well. RPG MMO. Uh, yeah, you know, you, you if if you do the, the Quixel, you might end up filling that up super quick. So... Um, However, you should know that it's not terribly expensive to add more hard drive space. If you're like, our team needs more and I'm willing to spend $3 for the weekend, you can have yourself a whole lot of hard drive space. It's, it's really flexible. So I'll show you uh, how to set that up um, and how to get Perforce installed. And what's really nice is we've worked with Perforce um, and Amazon to make this a little smoother um, and a little easier and a little more automated a little bit. So let me get started here. Let's open up the right browser over to the right sharing window. Let's see here. And then I shall share this screen here. Everyone see the screen here? Super interesting. So this is where you go to get your Amazon free uh, account. Um, just one member of your team needs to do this. Uh, Whoever is going to be your sysadmin. Uh, you just go ahead and create a free account. It ties into, you know, a, a Gmail account or whatever your Amazon account is. Um, I already have an account. So when I click free account, it just, good to go. And it, it takes a couple of minutes. This might be something that you want to do before the game jam actually kicks off is Get this set up because there's a couple steps here that require a little bit of processing time, but not much. And so this is your management console. And, and what you get here is this is where you can build virtual servers that live on Amazon servers and you can use them for whatever you want. You could use them for gameplay. You could put a gameplay server on them, you know, database, host a website. In this case, we're going to host our, uh, our Perfor server. Um, and so the next thing we do is um, pretty easy. Uh, go to the Perforce site. So I was going to write up all of this stuff. Um, and we'll just uh, throw this link into the share here. Um, so if you go to the Perforce site and you go to setting up Perforce, you'll end up with this like step by step. Um, and you can see that. Um, it even gets to configure your game engine. Perforce has become such a kind of standard in the game space that they're kind of assuming that most people coming in to use Perforce these days are using a game engine. So there's directions on how to use it with Azure as well. So if you're already an Azure customer, or you're more comfortable with the Google ways, go for it. They're, they're free offerings, very similar. Um, we're gonna use the, the AWS. And so the first thing we're going to do is go to install on AWS. And they are a partner and they've gone and built a template already. So step by step, we go to our AWS account, which is where I was here. And we can search right here for services and you just type in Perforce. And there it is. And what this is, is you subscribe to it. And when you subscribe to it, it just gives you a shortcut to building these servers super easily. And so typically speaking, you can see I've already subscribed. Sorry, 
uh, there will be a, do you want to subscribe? And it takes, I don't know, two minutes for me uh, for it to figure out that I was subscribed and I was able to go. And so um, that's all you have to do. And then you continue to subscribe, which is a weird way of putting it. Um, and you see what you get here. And basically what they're trying to tell you is no matter what server you put this on, it'll be free. And so Amazon offers all of these server types um, all the way from the very, very basic server all the way up to a very crazy large 16 GPU server of Doom. Uh, <laughs> those servers are not free, but using <laughs> Perforce on those servers is free, <laughs> not to be confused. So this is just to see, you know, make sure that it's not going to kill the bank. So just go ahead and continue to configuration. And this is where we build one of these servers. And so the first thing we do is we, we make some choices here and we don't have a lot of choices here. Uh, we're gonna choose the only choices here, but we do get to choose where our location is. And this is fairly important. Um, so if you're you know on the West Coast, you should choose something on the West Coast. If you're on the East Coast, choose something on the East Coast. Me in Colorado, it thinks North Virginia is the best. So I go with that. Uh, it won't make a huge difference overall, especially if your team's uh, distributed, but it'll make a uh, connection a little bit quicker. Might as well be as close as possible. And then that's all you need to do. And then you go to continue to launch. And so here you have a choice of launching from this website, which is I should call it a wizard, or you can use the EC2 console. Uh, I recommend using the website if you have never used their consoles before. Um, otherwise, you're going to get lost pretty quick, I think. And so it defaults to a, a C5 4X large, which is a pretty beefy computer. Um, you probably don't need all of that to run this. In fact, if you did, this one's, I think, about $500 a month to run. So Careful, you can get into non-free territory real quick here. Make sure that you are on, uh, I think, T2 Micro. Um, you know what? And I'm just remembering, I walked through this and I found a small problem with their setup. So we're actually gonna go and do this through EC2 the hard way. It's not that much harder. And we're just going to say launch, and, and I'll show you why here. So when we do launch, we actually get to our configuration page. And so here are our choices here, and you can see this is a little more clear. So now we can see that this server is eligible for the free tier. These servers are not. They will cost you the money. So we will go next to the instance details. There's nothing here you need to change unless you know what you're doing and you see something here that you need to change. I didn't see any. And here's where the important difference is, is by default, for whatever reason, they only give you eight gigabytes of hard drive space. That's not enough. You can have up to 30 for free. So let's make that 30. Uh, and again, you can go over that, but you will have to pay for it. It's not terribly expensive, especially if you're using it for a few days. Um, and then uh, you just say review and launch. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. We're going to add tags. You can add tags if you want. You don't have to. If you have a lot of servers, it can help you find the right servers. Uh, but we don't really. And then this one is really important. So this is something that's nice. It automatically sets this up. You used to have to do this by hand. So these are the firewall rules that let your Perforce users talk to the server. Otherwise, the servers are, you know, very secure and you can't log into them. So um, you, can, you can see right here, you create a new security group and you give it a name. It gives it this horrible, horrible name. I'll just call this Helix Core. And then it gives it a description. It's just fine. Uh, so what it gives us is port 22, so we can SSH in if we need to. Um, and then it opens up port TCP 1666, which is the default per force port. Um, and basically it's accessible by everyone. And then we review and launch. Um, we're just gonna make sure we've got our, our, 
our micro server. We've got our security groups um, and make sure that you're getting all your 30 gigs of hard drive space. And then you hit launch. When you do, it's gonna come up with this window. Uh, this is really important. You have to create a, a certificate pair. And this just means that when you log in remotely to the server, whether through C or SSH or whatever, it can verify who you are because when you first make a server, there's really no users and stuff other than like a default route. So the certificate proves to the server that you are the person who set it up. So you have to make one. Um, and all you have to do is say, create new pair, give it a name. We'll call this like Tom's per course. Uh, you download it. And you can see I've downloaded a couple here today, <laughs> but it downloads that to my downloads folder. And if I need to log in through SSH or whatever, this is what I'll use to get there. And then we launch our instance. We won't even need this today, quite honestly, because Perforce on the server has already been installed and configured. Uh, and so we can just get to it. So our instances are now launching. Um, uh, if you're planning on leaving this up, for more than the weekend, you might want to create billing alerts and make sure you don't get charged a bunch. Uh, but anyway, we're going to go ahead and if we click here, we'll be sent to our back to our, our management console, just like we were before. But now we have our instance running. Uh, so you can see it's initializing, it's booting up right now. Uh, and here's our IP address. Uh, and we're good to go. We can actually just log right in here. So on each of your client machines, you have to install the client, Perforce client. And that's, it's super easy. You know, you type in Perforce and the thing you're looking for, and Perforce keeps changing their name. If you're looking for P4B, I, I misspelled Perforce, but luckily Google knows what I'm talking about. And you'll want to go find the visual client. Uh, and you select, you know, your, your platform, Windows 64. You only get the latest version. And you download and install. Um, and installing is, is very straightforward. It just asks where to install. You're good to go. It's a very lightweight sort of program. So I've already got Perforce installed. So I'm going to launch that. So Perforce installs with two things. Um, you get this, which is the Perforce client. And you also get an administration console where you can like set up you take a look at that. But let's go back to just following the directions <laughs> and seeing if it works. So I've already gone ahead and we did all this. We subscribed, we configured, we launched, we launched through EC2. And you can see here. They actually have the directions for the two ways. So if you decide to launch through the website or through EC2, as we did, where we can uh, change the storage, uh, the directions are right there. So if you lost me or I lost you, here's exactly what we did with a little more information. And we're right there. We have clicked launch instances. Now you have Helix Core running on your AWS. And now we have to connect to our Helix core server. And we do this, and this is important. It took me a second to find this step here. Uh, typically, if you just download Perforce and install it yourself, there's no user and whoever logs in first becomes the super user. It's kind of terrifying. Because um, <laughs> it means if someone is timing it just right, they can take over your server. It doesn't really matter at that point, there's nothing on it but it's kind of a weird design choice. So when you do this, they actually set up a super user already named root and the password is this password. So not the most secure user ever, but slightly better than whoever gets there first owns the thing. Um, so a slight improvement. So we can connect uh, using this, uh, this root and password. And we're actually gonna use uh, Key for admin, and I know you can't see the start menu, but this is the other piece of software. And so we can connect either through P4 or uh, through the client here. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't really. 
So let's see. I'm I'm gonna follow the directions though. Let's go ahead and get this open. And what we need to do is get our out of here. Get our IP address back to I lost a whole tab apparently. We'll go back here and we'll put that in and then make sure you do colon 1666 or it won't connect. And for user, like I said, we'll do root. And then uh, when we now we want to create a new user for me, right? So it's kind of weird. You put in root here as your user and then you say, I want to make a new user. And you get to create a new user. Weird, but it works. So this username is going to be, you know, me. My name is Tom. My password is a secret. Say it out loud on the stream. Trying not to. And I'll make up a email here, Tom at Tom.com. So it's kind of interesting. Password is the only field that is not required. If you leave password blank, it'll ask this user to create a password when they log in. Again, not the most secure, but it's up to you as a sysadmin uh, to decide what dice to roll. And click so save and it's not going to do it the right way. All right. Let's try this then. I wanted to follow the directions, and so uh, they're almost right. So what we're going to do here <laughs> is make a new connection with our admin, and this is how I know how to create users. Um, so again, we're going to put in the right address. We're going to say user, root, OK. Uh, it should, here we go, ask for our password, which we know is that password. And there we go. Now we're connected and we're the administrator uh, logged in as root. So uh, the, what you need to do, and, and at this point, we can now go over back to our directions. And so, oh, there's this, uh, here we go. So we're at the end here. Let's go to the next one, which is configure. Uh, and this is kind of odd here. So here we go. Configure Helix Core. So I, d I don't like the way they wrote this because this is kind of where you need to go before you do the connection thing that didn't work, obviously. So bear with me here. So here we go. We, uh, we created our super user account. Um, and we're, we're root now. And then there's some, some security stuff here that it depends on how fancy you want to get, you know, if you're concerned about people stealing your game, go through all this. If you're like, well, this is going to be open for a weekend, who cares? who cares? But this is the right way of setting it up. Um, so we can we can follow this and do it. But really, um, you know, just make sure that in your it's so weird that my alt tab is not working in your administration panel here, once you get logged in. Uh, you go to password security level, and you want to make sure it's on three, uh, which is the highest highest password. You can see that you can you can fly pretty loose um, and just not even have passwords required. You know, again, it's up to you and your ease of use with your your team. Um, but I would recommend probably changing the root password. Uh, since it's that password and that's just simply change password and give your root a new password. And then you can create users for your team right here. So I'll create myself, right? Tom Shannon. Tom. And password. Do full name, Tom. So you have to fill in everything except password. And you hit OK. And now and your users and groups exist. Huzzah. And you go through that for your five team members uh, as you wish. 
So now you've got those set up. And then we're going to connect with our client. Now this should work. Uh, let's make sure we've got the right address. We do. Uh, user is Tom Shannon. I have to look. Did I do Tom dot Shannon or Tom Shannon? Just Tom Shannon. Great. So we've got our user set up. Now the next thing we have to create is for each user, you need what's called a workspace. And this is kind of a weird concept, but try and think of it as just telling the server that this is a specific machine or a specific place on the hard drive where this person will be working from. So this is where all the files will download, your project files and all the content. This is where on your hard drive you want to work. Um, and so one user might have multiple workspaces. Like I've got a workspace on my desktop and a workspace on my laptop. Two separate workspaces because I want the server to understand that I can make changes here and I can make changes here and they're independent. If you use one workspace for multiple places, pain happens. It doesn't happen right away, but it does happen. Uh, and you can ask anyone who's tried that, they'll say the same thing. Don't. Uh, just make, go ahead and have workspaces for each of your users. So in this case, you know, I'll, I'll say laptop. In fact, I'm going to make a new workspace. Oh, I need to enter my password. So you know things are working when it's asking you stuff. So this is the new workspace. And so we give it a name. Let's call this, you know, Tom laptop. And then a workspace root. This is, again, really important because you want to know where your files are going to go. So by default, it throws it here. I like to have my stuff like just sitting at root C under Perforce. And I'll make a new folder in here. Let's call this game. Boom. So now all of the files that are on the server will go into that folder. And whatever folder structure is on the server will be mirrored in this folder. So. This is where I'm going to work from. And then we just hit OK. We're good to go. Don't need any stuff. And so now we have our server, our user, and our workspace. And we and it's going to want to know what text encoding. So we'll go with that. And when we do, we get this wizard. Ignore the wizard. We don't want that wizard. Not today, wizard. Wizards for other people. And we get the Perforce. And so what we have here is we've got our depot, which is our server out on Amazon, and our local copy. And so we can see how these work. So real quick, I'll show you uh, adding this. So again, you can go through the directions here. Um, I do recommend, if you are going to go through this, um, setting up your file mappings. Um, actually really easy. Um, in fact, why don't I do it? So Perforce is kind of weird. It's when you install that, that interface and you log in, you actually kind of set up some settings and now you have access to a bunch of command uh, stuff through P4. So if you go to C command, you've got all, you can do all of your Perforce, Perforce stuff through the command line too. And one of the things you can do there and you can't do through the interface is to set up these file mappings. And that just tells the server, when I get this certain type of file, treat it this way. I get a, an Unreal file, do this with it. When I get a text file, do this with it. It just helps uh, overall. And so all you have to do is in here, like you see, you type in P4 type map, and you open up a text editor. This is so weird. This is one of the weirdest workflows ever. And you can see there's already stuff in here, but what you do is go down, here's Unities, and here's Unreals. And you just copy this all the way from type map, all the way down, Control-C to copy it, apparently not Alt-Tab ever again, and just paste these in. And you can add that, that spacing, it doesn't matter. And then you just hit File, Save, close it, and nothing seems to happen. Oh, ah, I got a syntax error. Sweet. How did that happen, y'all? 
I guess it does need the tabs. Why didn't I get tabs? Am I wrong? No. <laughs> Why? It's like I'm doing a live demo. Who knows an easy way to add tabs before each line? Let's see if that picks up. Turn. Thank you. Thank you, Perforce. I even like break out of this. There we go. Let's try that again. So apparently they didn't add in the thanks. Thanks, Perforce guys. Thank you. So you should see type map saved. Um, so you will have to go in and, you know, for the sake of brevity on the stream here, I won't go in and add in all the tabs, um, but this will just help. It's again, not totally necessary. You could just start going, but these are kind of uh, nice things that'll help out. Let's get back to the good stuff here. Get rid of that. All right, so I'm, I'm the first user and I need to share my game with everybody. So I'm actually gonna come here, grab out of my downloads. We got Ooh. all right. So I've already got a project, and it's the Game Jam Toolkit. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that whole Game Jam Toolkit. And I'm going to move it. X, you know, control C, I'm going to move that to Perforce. And I'm going to put that right in there. Boom. Now I've moved my whole project over to a folder. And as long as you move all of the content with your project, you can move it wherever you want. And it'll just start back up. If I now I come back here to Perforce and I have to click refresh. Perforce doesn't refresh on its own. It's actually a good thing. And we can see, here's all my stuff. Here's all the, the project files, just like we see right over here to the right. On the depot, there's nothing. So all we've done is just move stuff into a folder. Now we have to add that stuff to the server. All you have to do is click on the files that you want, pay attention. You only want your U project, your config, and your content. Do not add these three. If you're doing a C++ project, you'll also want to include your source and binaries as well. Uh, we're doing a Blueprint project, so that's all we have to do. So, uh, so then all we have to do is we have to add them to the server. So we have to, again, unlike Google Box, Google Box, yes, unlike the Google Box children, it doesn't do this automatically. In Box and Google Drive, you just throw it on there and boom, everyone gets it. In, in this case, we are always explicit about adding, removing, changing things. Almost nothing is automated. We have to be very explicit about that because we don't want the wrong stuff up there and we don't want to break the project. So we want to add these. And the reason we don't add these three is that these are generated locally on everyone's machine anyway, and they're constantly updated. And you don't want to have to constantly modify all these files that everyone's just going to regenerate locally on their machine anyway. So these are the, the important ones. And you can see when we do, when we click add, It'll say 356 files opened for add, whatever that means. Uh, but what it means is that they've been added to a list in Perforce that says, hey, I want to add these to the server. Now, if we go to the server, they're still not there. We've just signaled our intentions. Hey, <laughs> we're going to want to add these. And so now we have to add them ourselves. And we could, again, we could hand select them and I'm, you know, control clicking, or you can choose individuals or the root. When you click submit, what it's going to do is this is when it actually adds the files to the server. But before it does, we have to give it a description. So we have to say what we did. Edit game server. 
Yay. And then we hit submit. And this is when it's actually transferring the files to Amazon. I'm now copying those files to Amazon in the exact state that they are on my machine. So now my machine and Amazon are exactly the same. So then, once this happens here, so this is so something that's really important is if I go and look at the depot now, you won't see anything, even as it adds these files. When you submit things using Perforce and most uh, uh, version control software, so it does what's called an atomic commit. So basically, it won't put any files onto the server unless they all successfully copy. So you don't have to worry about it getting halfway through here and your internet connection dying and, oh, no, I broke the game. It won't apply that unless it's successful. So it, it makes sure that everything got up there. There were no conflicts. Okay, now we can add this new change to our, our game. Um, so this is taking a second because, you know, I'm streaming and transferring files to North Virginia. Eventually. Come on, you can do it. The nice thing is that this is this actually has a progress bar now for those old Perforce users. We used to just get this moving little blue thing in the corner, and we just had to guess that it was working until it stopped the blue thing, and then we knew it was done. So this is a, a really big improvement. Um, and so What's going on now too, also behind the scenes, is Perforce has done something to my files locally. What it's done is it's gone and put, huh, it hasn't yet because the commit's not over. I was hoping it would have done that already. So what it will do actually is set the read-only attribute to all of these files that are in our workspace here. And that's a way of it helping you not modify stuff outside of the system. It's not infallible, obviously. You can just go and unlock them, but you probably shouldn't. So here we go. We're, we're almost at 90. Do it. You can do it. All right, while it's doing this, what I will do is I'm going to, oh, we lost Mark. Oh, there we go. I don't need to. We, uh, we there uploaded we Mark to the server. <laughs> and now we can get him from anywhere. And so <laughs> now, if I go to Depot and look, hey, here's our game. Sweet. So what does this mean? Well, this means that someone else on my team can get this exact copy. And so I'm gonna go ahead and just super quickly open connection and make a new user from here. I don't think I'm gonna just make a, a second user for myself. Here's my new user, Tom2. Do add Tom to me. Full name. Cool, I've got a new user. Actually, open a connection. This top two. I'm going to make a new workspace. Oh, wait, what did I call my user? Oh, capitalization matters. That's a funny name for a user. Password is. I am sure there is a uh, password is Twitch user called Capitalization Matters. A good band name. <laughs> so uh, again, I'm going to go to uh, where do we? I'm going to go back to our C drive. And per four. Okay, we've got a game jam here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new folder, call this game jam two. We'll select that folder as our root and click okay. Okay. 
Yes, yes, click many OKs. And so now these are our two users. So I'm logged in as two different users here, which is a, a pretty special skill. And now as this user to get the game, what I have to do is I have to click on the depot or the individual content and I say, get latest. And this downloads it, which should download faster, hopefully, uh, from Amazon. And so now these two users, we can pretend that Tom2 is somewhere else. We now have exactly the same files. And now as I make changes in one, I submit those up and bring them down. Now I know we're, we're long on time because, uh, you know, it's a stream. So I, I want to kind of wrap up just, I don't, I can't go through the whole workflow. Um, however, we've gone through the workflow quite a bit in some other places. Um, but I wanted to show you really just how fairly easily, it's still not like click easy dumb button, but it's getting closer. <laughs> we're, we're working with uh, Perforce and Amazon to actually create that just like, I need game jam server. Um, so this is this is where we're at, uh, and so you know, check out those instructions. Realize that if you're feeling stuck, look forward in the instructions a little bit, um, and uh, and then um, I'll I'll link in in the forum post and in the chat here uh, some some resources. We've got a couple live streams we've done. Um, as well as, you know, some pretty good documentation. There's also a lot of community stuff. Uh, I just did, you know, a quick Google search on Perforce Unreal Engine 4. Um, there's great stuff from Michael Aller, Dev Enabled, us, um, lots of stuff. So it's really, I just wanted to show that you can get this kind of complicated techie thing set up fairly easily. I'm not going to pretend like it's the easiest thing ever. It's not as cool and easy as like Mixer was. Um, we can't all be as cool and easy as Mixer one day. Yeah. Um, but it's really essential. And, and if you're working on a remote team, look into Perforce or SVN. A lot of teams use Git. If you're used to using Git, Unreal supports Git. Um, that also leans on AWS. Um, so, you know, choose one for sure, uh, and, and get it, set it, get started before the game jam, because otherwise sharing the, or you'll just end up being the one developer and everyone will send you all of their asset files and you will have to import them all and be that person. And I've seen that. I've been that guy. <laughs> and that's part of why I learned Perforce. Uh, and uh, it's just, it's really, really essential. Yeah, we've uh, been to game jams where there have been quite a few Perforce servers set up. And it, it's also not hard, you know. It's once not. Again. And, and at game jams, oftentimes you can just set up a Perforce server on any computer or laptop that you have. And if you're all on the same network, it works the same. So if yeah. you're all on the same network, you don't even need an external server like Amazon. All of that complication is so that a distributed team can get to the same server. Yeah. Uh, and you can yeah. set it up or ahead if of you're time. Admin, you're like, I already have a sweet server. Yeah. You can install it on your sweet server. Right. You can set it up. If the game jam starts on Friday, you can set it up on Thursday. Uh, right. And. Uh, yep. And then not even have to worry about it. So. Yeah, and, you know, I, I actually have one of these servers that I've left running for the last nine months. Uh, and because I wanted to see if it would ever trip over the free tier. And on the longer months, the months with 31 days, I'll get like on the 28th day, I'll get a warning that's like, you're about to go over, but you get 750 hours, which is 31 days. <laughs> so uh, as long as you don't, you know, add more hard drive space or more CPUs, you're good. Uh, and that's, it's fairly hard to do. You kind of have to spin up a whole new server to do that. So um, yeah, once you have it set up, it, it seems to just go on. And I think you get 12 months of free tier access. Um, and then if you're an educator or a student, you can have that extended while you're in school. 
That was great, Tom. Um, Thank you. Let really super helpful. Uh, and, you know, yes, it's not the sexiest thing. That's why we asked Seven to do a demo on GIMP next. <laughs> I hope that's the editing software, Lewis. <laughs> Uh, Actually, no. I, I started using, I found out uh, about uh, PhotoP, photo, photopea.com. Someone just uh, has been recreating Photoshop just in a browser. <laughs> and it just, it works as, as well as uh, you'd like it to. Us. It's very amazing <laughs> in terms of like talking about game jam tools. You don't want to download the creative suite. Um, Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's sure. really cool. There are also the you know, there are a lot of browser based tools now that are, are really pretty impressive. And yeah, it's 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 kind of, you know, we we've been doing these streams for a few years and uh, it used to be kind of a small list of resources and here's some free stuff and maybe consider Blender. Um, but you know, now it's it's like overwhelming with the the amount of resources that are out there. Uh, a little bit more about what do I do with all this stuff? Um, Mark, uh, it's like 9.30 p.m. in the UK, so Mark was about to eat his arm off, and uh, so he um, had to bow out. Um, oh. But, Seven, you've got some, some thoughts you wanted to share uh, also as we start to wrap up today's stream. Um, are you yeah. ready to share? Yeah, yeah. And I'll just I'll just talk this out. Um, you know, and um oh uh sorry, someone asked in the chat, uh the the Photoshop tool uh photo p uh, photo p e a dot com. Um you just go there, you'll see it. Uh but I wanted to um uh talk about specifically making a jam game and, and I'll keep this fairly quick, but um, in my experience, I've seen and played a lot of jam games. And um, I have seen what makes a good jam game and what makes a less good jam game. And uh, for, for an example of some of these successful commercial games, you know, the, that started as game jam games and then went on to be like be commercially successful, um, keep talking and nobody explodes, surgeon simulator. Uh, a normal lost phone, um, home improvisation. These are like games that just started as I want to make an idea, and then it got really, really popular. Um, so, uh, first of all, when you're with your team, brainstorm and discuss a single experience related to the team that you want to explore. Uh, People will immediately jump to thinking of a game, but instead think, think of a single experience. Don't think about a genre and don't think about a story. Think about an experience that you, that you want to be there. So keep talking and nobody explodes, which I love as a game really was, okay, let's make a bomb defusal like the movies kind of game, you know, a cooperative bomb defusal game. They didn't think about what genre of game do we want to make? Because really, you know, what genre is bomb diffusing? I keep talking, nobody explodes. It's not, it doesn't really fit into a genre. And so often I see jam teams will say, all right, let's make a platformer or let's make a first person game or, you know, or they'll think about a story. They'll say, I want to make a game about this. Um, instead, think about this experience and then after you have figured out which experience you want to move with, think about action words. Mm. Uh, so the action words that are associated with that experience. And the example that I often give is like fighting on top of a train, which is super common scene in movies. Um, and if you think about all those movies that have you know two people fighting on top of the train, they have scenes where they're hanging on the edge of the car they're jumping from car to car. They're pushing each other, pushing each other uh, dodging signs and, and ducking under tunnels. Like that's the one that every every movie has that duck under a tunnel. Um, and the idea is, are you talking about that thing where they're fighting on the train and one of them looks up and has to duck for the and yeah, the, and then the other person goes, oh, and then they yeah yeah. I mean that happens. Yeah, I've seen that in a few movies. 
Yeah. <laughs> and so once you've thought about all of these, you know, brainstormed all these different action words, uh, determine which ones you want to include in your game. Mm-hmm. You know, if if I think if I think about this experience that I want to make a game about, does this action need to be there? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, fighting on top of the train, pushing each other, dodging signs and tunnels, they feel as the most important part. Like without you know, without the whole pushing each other and, and the dodging the signs thing, you really don't have a fight on the train. That's why it's in every single movie. And, and so those are really the core experiences. And you get this list down really small because obviously you have a limited amount of time. And from there, you're able to determine the mechanics and systems um, and the win-loss condition. With these action words, you can think about the experience and you can think about the way you win or lose. So obviously with this example, you lose when you fall off the train. Uh, When you're the last one standing on the train, you've won. So understanding the action words you want in the game and the win-lose condition, that helps inform the mechanics. And you can take these action words of of pushing and, and dodging, and suddenly you have these mechanics of pushing and dodging. And you can, although I'd also, once again, preface against thinking about a genre, because immediately people think of a a third-person beat-em-up game with Mm -hmm. punches and kicks and parries and dodges. But if you don't think about a genre, if you think about the experience instead, you you don't need to jump to that, right? You could instead think about the experience is still fighting on top of a train. Maybe it's a first person grappling game set in VR where you just can, all you can do is grapple, move back and forth. You can't move your legs. And it's a, uh, you know, you have a balance meter to hey, stay in the center anytime you get pushed. Just a, a, a different experience instead of immediately jumping to genre, which is a super common pitfall. And lastly, The other thing that's super important about jam games is called the elegance test. So the the elegance test is when you have simple systems that perform robustly in complex situations. Mm. That's a really complicated way of saying just that like every mechanic serves numerous purposes. So in Pac-Man, the dots you collect are the ways, that's the way you win the level. It's the way that the player knows where they have to go. It's the way it adds score. So it shows how well the player is doing. And it's also how you earn extra lives. And so you have such a limited amount of time in a jam that you want each mechanic to serve a lot of purposes. Mm. Because if it, if it doesn't, you know, a, a big uh, game design pitfall in the beginning is this um, adding variety to make for good design, adding more and more when in actuality you add less mm-hmm. and you make the things be a part of, you make each thing be a really important part of the experience. Mm-hmm. So let's say for this train. So each individual thing that's in it, like if you're going to develop, spend the time to develop something, mm-hmm. also it seems like it would be more effective of your time to develop one thing that accomplishes three three or four things rather than three or four individual things that have to interact together because that i find is one of the things that just absolutely destroys you know figuring Mm -hmm. you know things working in the end is there's too many systems that don't quite work together but when you've got this you know, instead of having a blue dot for score and a you know, red dot to do this, it's it's all white dots, all white dots. And they do these three things. And now the dot just, you know, it's it's a lot easier for you to grok. And, you know, as a judge, I, you know, I've played games where I didn't really understand why I was doing a thing because that thing only had like one purpose. And it was like, oh, but I don't even need that to get to the end of the level. Um that's that's really interesting advice about not just scoping down, but even bringing scope down to a single to fewer objects. Object yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, elegance is a way of it keeps it, it keeps scope small and design good. 
Like you can think as a judge, when I see elegant design, I go, Ooh, Hmm. Uh, you notice that as you're playing the game, you go, Ooh, that was clever. And that gets you kind of the, ah, they they did that thing. And the hearts do that. And that Mm. neat. It takes, it takes Uh, maturity. It doesn't it uh, sometimes. uh, What'd you, what'd you say? It it takes takes maturity to, to, uh, and discipline to, to, uh, to be able to pull that off. Yeah, yeah, and and playing a lot of games. Uh, I give the example Celeste. Celeste is a fantastic example of a super simple game, very simple mechanics, but like incredibly elegant. Where all the mechanics you're given all add up to everything else. Um, yeah, and and just a quick example of elegance. You know, we're talking about this this train top fighting game. Uh, if you pretend I go with a two D platformer design and you know, you're fighting back and forth and there are um, uh, highway signs and tunnels flying by and you have to jump over them and under them. And often games like this will have power-ups that you can grab randomly, they'll randomly appear. Um, But instead, if you had these, you know, signs flying by and if you went under them, that was the thing that gave you the speed boost. That was the thing that that gave you the, the jump boost. You don't need to build the power-up system, and it's based around something the game already wants you to do, and then suddenly you have to decide, do I easily go over this sign, or do I try and get underneath it for the boost, Mm. where it's all built into a a much more... Contextual, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a much a system that is more elegant than just, hey, let's have power-ups here, too. Mm. Um, So, well, that was very quick. you can uh, re-listen to what I said because I speak very fast. Uh, but and use this, uh, please use the elegance test for uh, for your jam games. That's great advice. Really, yeah, really good advice. Thank you. I have an incredibly specialized knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's great, though. I, I you know, uh, it's it's hard to tell. You know, and this is for everything, game jams or submitting portfolio pieces, uh, trying to get into the head of the judges, figure out what they're looking for uh, mm-hmm. is really key. And I think game jams are a, a different beast than your usual product because failure is fine. Uh, you know, if parts of it don't work or it crashes at the end or whatever, you have to hold hands. That's sometimes just fine. Uh, whereas most products don't have that <laughs> sort of luxury. Uh, and the other nice thing is you, you have to know that everyone else you're playing against is has the same constraints and the same, uh, you know, same judges, same amount of time. Um, and, you know, I've seen these hotshot teams come in and they, they can't pull it together. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the time, you know, they're too used to having years to develop a game. They don't know how to do it in a weekend. Everything they've learned is against that. Um, so, you know, I think I think your advice there is is really good for anybody developing from pro to beginner. You know, it's the nice thing about the game jam is that it forces everyone to keep it simple. Uh, and you know, I think it's a really cool level playing ground uh because you know i've seen people who have never touched game development before join a team and do exceptionally well i've seen people who have been developing for 15 years come in and they get too caught on like trying to hit you know a performance target and (laughs) they they never ship the game out they fall in love but it runs really fast that's neat uh but there's no game there yeah. So, you know, it's very, it's a very leveling sort of thing. And so some I'm, folks really fall in love with hardware and then they're like, I must make this hardware game. And, and that can also be, I think, a bit of a challenge. Uh, you know, I think, uh, especially with regard to, you know, VR hardware or something like that. And I, I don't think there's any issues with, with making those types of games, but I think that, 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 uh, sometimes requires a very specialized team. Um, and if you have the team, that's great. If you don't, that can also um, make it for an interesting challenge. And there's nothing wrong with a good challenge. Um, 
but right. I think you have to know what you're signing up for. And be aware, kind of like being aware of the, uh, you know, you might not want to look first at genre. Uh, same for hardware. If you're like, if you, you know, you're like, I'm making a VR game uh, and, you know, the, the topic comes up and you're like, I can't think of any VR stuff. Well, you know, well, you know, think about think about the game and the topic first is is good advice. I keep, I mean, I, I keep bringing up, keep talking and nobody explodes, but that's such a good example. That game was initially built with the Razer Hydra, which was such a niche uh, controller right, that yeah. nobody, I mean, but you know, now, I mean, they, they released the Switch version for it, a uh, VR version, you know, every, like it's on everything, but you know, they, they weren't thinking, well, let's build a game for this controller system that won't exist in like six months. I'm saying this and now anyone watching is going to be like, I have I no have idea. One. Yeah, I have one, right? <laughs> I just bought one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking it up to see what even, even happened to it. Well, guys, I think we are coming to the end of our stream. Uh, and we should say goodnight to these nice people and let them go. Yes, I suppose so. Even but, though I'm sure we can talk for a lot. Oh, I've time. got more. <laughs> I've got a PowerPoint I haven't even got into yet. <laughs> when Bush is here and he says uh, that he enjoyed the stream and uh, hopefully the rest of you enjoyed the stream and you got some good things out of it. Um, it's, you know, we, we really enjoy doing these. We've got some uh, good couple streams coming up. Um, I think I mentioned this before. We've got uh, some amazing AAA UX developers coming up in the next couple of weeks, uh, both a UX a research team and I think a UX UI team that uh, are some of Epic's finest uh, will be joining us to talk about uh, what it is that they do. This is another really, really important aspect to, to making games and um Mm -hmm. But not only games, you know, to now so much of what we do and uh, and every aspect of developing software in general and, and uh, experiences. So uh, we are really looking forward to talking to those guys. Uh, so stay tuned for um, our blog posts or our forum posts about uh, those streams and uh, more information. So uh, any final closing thoughts from either of you gentlemen? This stream, the the VOD will be up. The VOD um, will be up. Once we're done, I think it goes up. So if you missed some of that or you want to go back and follow along with Tom uh, through Perforce and AWS or uh, any, any things we discussed, it'll be up so you can do so. Mark, yeah. we hope you're having a, 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 a nice meal or maybe you already went to bed. Uh, but thank you once <laughs> again for your uh, helpful thoughts and uh, helpful tips. Thank you again, Mark. Thank you, uh, Seven. And we hope you all stay yeah. safe and continue to join us. And um, we will see you next Tuesday. Bye, everybody. Bye, y'all. See you later.